Okay, so we're going to get started with exercise 214. Um, and today we're, we're kind of shifting a little bit in the strategy of modeling. And we've been going that direction with the topography, but now you'll actually get into doing some design work on your own. But we're going to be, instead of focusing on the small objects, the little things that build up as components to make the big object, we're going to instead flip over to the side of the big object and then start to add progressive levels of detail. To me, this marks kind of a fun part in the class because you transition into really you're doing your own thing. And I'm not dictating, you're going to make this anymore. It's something that's coming out of your head. Uh, but it's also kind of the, the lead into the V-Ray section where we actually get things like glass and environments and sun and you know, ultimately water and, and the things that everybody wants to do. It's kind of like the transition which will happen in another, uh, I think it happens after spring break when we start to get into lighting and night renderings. And that's the other piece of the puzzle that everybody always wants to do. So it's kind of fun to get to that point. We still have a little bit of work to do today to get prepped for our environment settings and our suns and, and all of that thing. Um, so today we're going to build a bunch of skyscrapers. The idea being that one of the ones that you build today may be good enough to use down the road. Um, and then we'll focus, instead of building the skyscraper next class, we'll focus on building the environment around the skyscraper, be able to put it in San Francisco, do the rendering, and all that kind of thing. So um, it's definitely the, the new shift in where we're going. You did also get a handout for your next assignment, which is assignment 203, um, which is to model a skyscraper and to ultimately put it into a scene and render it. Um, the renderings should have sun systems, background HDRIs, clouds in the sky, and all that sort of stuff. So we'll go through how to do that um, as we go forward, but that's kind of the direction we're going. I like to give you these well in advance of when they're actually due. So um, this one is not due until April 17th. Technically speaking, I probably should have made it due the week before that, but that's the week that you get back from spring break. And if I made it due on Monday when you got back from spring break, you would all come up here and you know murder me with pitchforks and stuff. So I did not make it due that week. It's due the week after. So you can safely ignore my class during spring break and have a good spring break and then come back and still have a little bit of time and, and panic then instead of panicking on spring break. So um, I will not have any comment about any of your other classes. But I try to be the nice person and not give you any work to do, OK? So um, anyway, that's kind of where we're going. You don't have anywhere near the skills that you have to do this yet. So just kind of be thinking that it's coming. Uh, and different than 135, I give you these assignments way in advance of when they're due so you can kind of see that it's coming and, and where we're going with it. Don't forget also that your topography is due on Wednesday, the, the DWG file. I panicked everybody when I said I thought it was due today. But it's not. It's due on Wednesday. And your actual physical model is due the Monday before spring break. So again, I made it due before spring break so that you can safely not worry about it over spring break. OK? So I'm super nice. Remember that. Okay. Spring break is the first week in April. So I think Friday the 31st is the last day of, of class. I don't know if the weekend class happens that first weekend or whether they get it off. I have no idea. I don't take weekend class. I don't teach weekend class. So don't quote me on that. But uh, after Friday the 31st is your spring break. Um, and trust me, I'm looking forward to it just as much as you are. So uh, it's the nature of teaching, right? It's the nature of being a student. So anyway, let's get into actually building a skyscraper. And so when I, when I go about this, I'm going to show you today some strategies for transformations, for making interesting, unique skyscrapers, et cetera. Some people will push the boundaries of what's doable. And certainly in the world of Rhino with no gravity and no structural calculations necessary, you can do that. Um, generally speaking, the more you, you twist and lean, the harder it would be to build. But in this exercise, I'm encouraging you to twist and lean and, and do goofy stuff because it can be fun. So we're going to start with kind of a basic shape. And I'll go ahead and draw that basic shape uh, just using the regular um, box tool, corner to corner with a height. Let me make sure I have the correct assignment up here so that I can reference all of my points. There we go. Uh, and we're going to do a 
building footprint of 200 feet by 100 feet. So I'll go ahead and say at 100 feet comma 200 feet. And we're going to do a 600 foot high building. So I'll type 600 feet for my building height. And that gets me my basic rectangle that represents the building. And we can go ahead and switch that over into shaded mode. And there it is. So from here, we're going to work through a variety of ways of transforming the building. And I'll show you some different ways and some different strategies as we go forward. Uh, number one is I could simply, instead of doing a box as I move forward, and I'm going to be creating buildings side by side by side as I go through these. So I could instead say, OK, well, let me take my regular rectangle tool, and I'll say at 100 feet, comma 200 feet. And then I could take this curve, and I could copy it. We'll type V for vertical. I'll go to 300 feet, and then to 600 feet, like that. And I could make some transformations of this curve as I went through. So say, maybe this top one, let me turn on my midpoint snap. Let me clip this corner there to there. And I could tri clip that corner. And maybe I want to clip this lower corner here. So let me do a fillet. Uh, and we'll do, sorry, I want to do a chamfer. Oh, uh, well, I don't know. What should our distance be? Let's do 50 feet. And we'll clip uh, 50 feet. That's fine. We'll go there to there. And that clips that corner. Whatever. I'm making it up as I go along. So we'll take that. We'll join it. And then I can take, I can go from here to here, and I can type loft, and it'll build that little piece. And then I can go from here to here and say loft, and it'll build that piece. And so maybe that building starts to be a little bit interesting. So you see that I'm creating the profiles and then ultimately doing the, uh, the surfaces. One of the things that's important, though, when we're um, building these surfaces is I'd like to to make them buildable and if I have bulging curves it's really complicated even if you look at and this just happens to be sitting up here right we have the the facade you look at it has these bulging pieces of glass those there there aren't that many of them they're all the same and they probably cost an absolute fortune to make they're small too so if you do that on the scale of a building it's going to be absurdly expensive. So we're going to try to avoid that, and we're going to stick in what are called ruled surfaces, which generally lofting will always get you there. Um, this is a complete side note, but the Prada, have you guys seen the Prada building in, in Japan? The one on top of each other looks like a basket? This one. This one. Have you guys seen that one before, maybe? OK. so. It, it has some very special pieces of glass. Let's see, there we go. You can see them better. There's these little diamonds. It's a structural diagrid uh, setup. And there's special pieces of glass that are scattered around the, the building. So these pieces of glass, and why I'm telling you this, I have no idea. But it's interesting. So whatever, we're going on the side, right, side route. Okay. So these pieces of glass were made in Italy specifically for this building and shipped to Japan. When they made them, they had to create a special cast and a special process to, to make each of these panes of glass. And in the process, they knew that some of them were going to get broken along the way. So they made a certain number of extra. And I think by the time the building was actually made, they only had a handful of each of the extra pieces left by the time they got shipped and all the rest of it to go in there. So you have this building that's built. And let's say that uh, they get really mad at Trump and they have a riot. I don't know why they would, but let's just say they did. And somebody decided to break these windows. Well, if you break more than the number that were manufactured at the time of this building being made, they no longer have this glass to put in the building anymore. So you have to think about when you're building these kinds of projects, what's the long-term trajectory of this building? And what happens when something like that happens and the glass gets broken? How are you going to replace it? And so these are the things that you want to be aware of as a designer. I have no idea why that was relevant. But at the same time, it's a really cool building. See? So look it up. It's really cool. Anyway, sorry. Nothing to do with anything. We're not building that building right now. <laughs> OK, so 
What I did essentially to avoid that is I went with basic ruled twisting surfaces. So I could split this up into surfaces that were flat planes. So as long as I'm connecting one plane to another, right, it's like a, it's like a piece of paper, I can twist the piece of paper in certain directions. If I tried to make it bulge, right, I can't do that. So I can't make it bulge out because the paper would wrinkle. So what we're doing is we're working with a standard piece of paper by doing it this way. So anyway, we'll talk more about that as we go forward, but I wanted to point that out. Does it have to have that twist, the twist look or not? No. For example, no. It, could be any, it can be anything that you want. So yeah. let's say instead, right, let me start with that, that curve at the bottom here. Let me copy it over. And we'll continue working our way up. Let's say instead, I just wanted to take a chunk out of this building. Right, so maybe I'll go... Do something like that. Oops, one too many. Let me join. Let me copy. V for vertical. We'll go up 300 feet. And then we'll go up 600 feet. And maybe by the time it gets to the top, um, I don't know, something else happens to it. It turns into this. And I could go here to here. And actually, I could probably loft all the way through. Let's tr give it a shot here and see. Yeah, that one twisted too much. The reason it twisted so many is I have one line segment here, and I have multiple line segments here. So really, this needs to be two different line segments. Let me take this, and let me split it with that. No, oh, it didn't like me. Well, anyway, let's try. Let's, let me see if I can just lock this together. Yeah. Let me rebuild this one. not doing exactly what I wanted to do. But anyway, you, you get the idea, OK? And then I could take this lower section there and that section, and I could loft that together as well. And I could end up with that. So let's say that I take this piece again. And let's copy it over. And let me just copy it vertical 300 and 600. And let me go ahead and loft all three together at once. So I'll loft, and I'll come around, and you guys say, yeah, OK, whatever. It's not that exciting. Okay? But I can take this polysurface, and I can come over to remember those points on and points off that we used before? I can turn on, sorry, wrong button. I can turn on right here the points on. Ah, I'm going to have to do it as separate surfaces. Let me explode it and then turn my points on. And then I'll end up with little tiny points that are on my object that I could then manipulate. So I could, for example, rotate those points by 15 degrees. And suddenly, my building would have a little twist to it. So that's one way of kind of establishing it and building it up that way. I prefer, rather than doing it this way, I prefer to take the object and do something called a cage edit because you have a little bit finer grain control. So let's go back to where I have my straight object and let's explore cage edits. So with cage edits, I can either type cage edit or I can go to transform, I think, cage editing and then cage edit. When I do that, it's going to say, select control object, or do you want to create a bounding box? I usually just go straight to a bounding box. Cage editing allows you to create a separate object that you can use to control the, the first object. And to me, it starts to get to be too much work to keep track of second objects and whatever. So we're just going to use a bounding box. Then we get into our coordinate system. 
and we want the world coordinate system, that's fine. I'll hit enter. Then the next piece here is something called cage points. And if we leave it at 4, 4, and 4 with a degree of 3, 3, and 3, when I hit enter, it's going to create, read into edit global, a bunch, a bunch of points in this grid. And so you can kind of see it's 1, 2, 3, 4 on each side. And then if I were to select them so that you could see them, see how I have interior points there as well. So it starts to be a lot of points to start to manipulate, but I could take those points and I could move them out and suddenly my building is going to curve. I could also take a smaller selection of points. Let me take uh, Oops, sorry, I accidentally right clicked. That was my problem. I could take a smaller section and I could pull those back and suddenly my building can start to balloon. I mean, you can see the, the flexibility there. The problem with this is that there's just too many control points to manage and it's really easy to start to create a bulge on one side of the building. Remember I talked about these being really difficult to make or manufacture? they will also not unroll when we try to flatten them out in, in Rhino, which is something you're going to be doing as part of your assignment, which is coming. So we're going to try to stay away from those, and I'm going to show you how to do it. So let's take this again. Let's copy this over. And we're going to do a cage edit on this again. So I can type cage edit or go to transform, cage editing, cage edit. And this time, same thing, bounding box, world, at the point level, we're going to drop this down. So my cage points in the x direction are going to be just 2. My cage points in the y are going to be 2. And my cage points in the z could be 4, but let's do 3 for simplicity's sake. Notice then that the degree changes, 1, 1, and then 2. For purposes of explanation, I'm going to leave the degree on the z at 1 as well. So it now has a degree of 1, 1, and 1. When I do this and I hit Enter, Region Edit Global, you see that I don't have nearly the number of points. I have points on the four corners, and because I said three points in the Z direction, I have points at the middle. At this point, if I were to take these top objects and say rotate them by, I don't know, say 30 degrees, you'll see that it will rotate, but it will keep the edges between them straight. That's a degree one curve, so it's a straight line. If I do the same object, and we do the same process, cage edit, bounding box, world, and this time 2, 2, 3, but I change the degree of the z to be 2, I can end up with a curving object. So we'll go ahead and hit Enter, and then Enter. Let me do the same thing to the top, rotate. And I said 30. And so instead of having the angle, it's now doing a curve all the way through the control point. So it's a much smoother process. This is still a developable surface. I can still unroll this into flattened objects because at any point from this curve to that curve, it's a straight line. That's how we can determine that it will develop. It will unroll. If we get into a curvature of 3, so if we did the same process and we did a curvature of 3, that's where we can tend to get into problems. So I'm going to caution you away from, from doing a three-dimensional, a three-degree curve. So when we come back here, let's do it one more time. I'll go back to Cage Edit, Bounding Box, World. And this time, we'll do a Z point count of 4. And I still want 1, 1, and I'm going to keep this at 2. I'll hit Enter global, and now you can see that I have more divisions that I can start to work with. I'm going to rotate this a little bit differently. I'm going to go and create a temporary line so that I can find the absolute middle of my building. And we'll take this section and we're going to rotate this around the center, we'll say 15 degrees, so it twists that way. This section here, we're going to rotate negative 20 degrees, so it goes back, and we'll take the top and we'll rotate, we'll call it 
five degrees, something like that. So very simply, I've worked to manipulate this shape, and it's become something that was very plain and turned into something that's a little bit more advanced. So the thing here, though, is I can take any shape, not just this shape, and do these kinds of manipulations to it. So let's say that I had at 200 feet, 100 feet, that's the wrong direction. Sorry. And I'm using this as kind of a, a guide for myself, but let's say, let's go over by 50 feet, let's go over by 25 feet. Take these, and I'm just going to mirror those across that side. Take this, 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 and this, and trim. Join. Uh, let me copy vertical 600 feet. And let me take these and we'll loft them together. OK, so I increased the complexity of this building a fair amount. Let me go ahead and patch the top, too, so I have a top surface. Patch. Come on there. And that's what you're going to slow down on? <laughs> All right. It was probably because it was 10 by 10. OK, so I end up with this as my shape. Let me go ahead and take this, and we'll cage edit this shape. So I'll go to my cage editing again, transform, cage edit. We're going to cage edit. Bounding box, world. We'll do the same thing. I'm going to simplify a little bit and do a 3 degree. And then we'll go ahead and hit Enter, and then Enter. Now I have my control points. And just as I did before, I could rotate these. We'll say 5 degrees that way. And we'll rotate this negative 5 degrees that way. And so the complexity of that building exists to start. It doesn't have to start with a rectangle. And then I end up with the twists and the curves. If I wanted it angular, I would do, do a degree of 1. So you can see the flexibility of kind of looking at it as a shape, as a modeling clay, as a, as a solid that I'm just playing around with to see what I want. Furthermore, I could take my straight shape and I could start to divide it up where I created a, you know, a clear story hole that went through the building. And then I could twist it using the cage edit. So you can build upon yourself. So create the simple building first then start to create the twists and the bends, et cetera. It's going to be your job today to create a bunch of these. And I think I say in the handout to create at least three. Uh, in all reality, I would probably create even more than that. But once you get to the point where you start to say, you know what, I kind of like this shape as a whole. I want to start working with this shape. We need to build it out as a skyscraper. We need to build more to it. So I'm going to work with this one is my, is my choice. And I'm going to go ahead and create a bunch of floors, and then I'll create an elevator core that goes through it. And I'll show you the process of doing that. So with this being my shape, I'm going to go ahead and start with a rectangle that is larger, a rectangular surface that is larger than my building itself. So sometimes it might be useful to look at it in the top view. Let's say something like that. And I make sure that that rectangle is larger than my overall size here. So at this point, I could copy vertical, copy, enter, V for vertical, and I could go up the first distance. So at this point, I think I say we have a 24-foot lobby. So I would go up 24 feet, and that would give me my lobby ceiling height. 
Then there's going to be some distances between the floors as well. So we're going to do 16 feet between each floor. So at this point, I could continue. And I could say 16 feet, and then I could add 16, and it would be 32 feet. And you, you get the idea. Okay, the problem there is that that involves a bunch of math. And we don't really like that. So we're going to use an array instead. So let me go ahead, first one, copy, V for vertical. And we'll go up those 24 feet, because it's different than the rest of the floors. And I'll hit Enter. Then I'm going to take this floor, and I'm going to do an array. So I'll type array. And it's going to say number in the x direction. Well, I do want 1. Number in the y direction is 1 as well. But number in the z direction, I want 36. Now my z spacing from right here is going to be at 16 feet. There it is. It's going to ask me for the direction. It's going to be going in that direction. And we can see that I made it all the way up. I might do 37 just so I have one more on the top. So I can come back here under Z number and say, no, actually, I want a 37. And that gets me all the way to the top of the building. So I'll go ahead at that point and commit to it, enter to accept. And now I have all of those floors established. Now I also have some distances between, so that was floor to floor, but there's always mechanical and stuff that happens in between the floors of the buildings. So I'm going to go ahead and take this first one. I'm going to copy it, V for vertical, and I'm going to go up by, let's say, 12 feet, which leaves me four feet between the floors for building services. And this would be my drop ceiling of the actual building. Then I'll take that piece and I'll array again. Number in the x is 1. Number in the y is 1. Number in the z will continue at 37. And my spacing is once again going to be 16 feet. The difference here is that I went up my 12 feet first, and then it'll be 16 because the ceilings are all 16 feet apart. So I'll be going in that direction like that, and I'll hit Enter. And now I have both the floors and the ceilings set up. In reality, I should have spent a little bit more time before I did that last one of ceilings, because it would be helpful if it was on its own layer. So let's go to, we'll call the ceiling. And I really should have taken all of those and made them floors. So let's change object layer, call this floor. This was a ceiling, so let's change it onto the ceiling layer. There we go. Then I'll array this 1, 1, 37. Start there, and there's 16 feet. We'll confirm that it looks right, and then we'll go ahead and hit the Enter key. There we go. Looks like I only needed 36. I do also, however, <coughs> need one more down here at the bottom. So let me go ahead and copy this. And we'll drop it down to right there. So I end up with the, the ceiling height in the lobby as well. So now that I have all of those floors and ceilings, I need to go ahead and trim them so that they're not hanging out of my building. So I'll go ahead and take my original shape here. And I'll use that as my trim. And I'll go ahead and type trim. And then select object to trim. I'm going to work my way up the side of the building. This is, can be, a little bit labor intensive. Come on. Really? Oh, come on. Got to love it when it doesn't work for me, right? Try that one more time. All right. So this is good. It doesn't work for me, so I have to move on to the next solution. And that is that I may need to intersect these surfaces with this surface. So let me go ahead and intersect. And when I do that, I should get a bunch of floor plate curves like that on every floor. So at that point, let me change those onto their own layer. Let me turn off. Make those current, turn those off. And you can see that I have these curves that I can then use as trims. 
and they are in fact working. So that's good. So let me select them all. And then let me go ahead and trim. Oh, don't tell me. How wonderful, right? <laughs> So while I'm waiting to come back, if I end up, notice I didn't save this, so this is kind of a problem for me. I need to wait a little bit. Um, while I'm waiting, why don't you get started on your basic skyscraper shapes. And then um, if I can get this to come back, I'll continue. If not, I'll rebuild this, and then we'll go from there. OK, so I couldn't make mine work. <laughs> So it kept uh, crashing on me every time I did it. So I moved over to the one I did before, uh, the, the slightly simpler one. And I have the two so that they're um, selected. And I'll go through and I'll trim off the floors as I go down and the ceilings. And it, instead of doing it all in one shot, if you do a few at a time, it tends to go a little bit faster. And once I've trimmed off all my floors and ceilings, I now have all of the floor plates. So if I were to turn off the, the skin of the building, I'd have what all the floor plates look like. So that's good. Let me turn back on the skin. And actually, I should rename. Actually, let's take the skin and put it on its own layer. Let's change it here. And we'll call this one skin. There we go. So now we have the skin. And the last piece of this is I'd like to cut an elevator core through the building so that we have that shaft that goes down through the building. So when I do that, it's helpful sometimes to start in your top view so you can see where an elevator core would fit. So let's say that I'm here, and let's say I do a 30 foot by 30 foot. So at 30 feet, comma 30 feet, elevators and stairs, something like that. I can then take that piece, and I could extrude the curve up to the building height, something like that. Once I have that through the building, I'm going to go ahead and explode it, deselect the top and the bottom, and then rejoin. Because the top and the bottom don't, don't play any bearing on what I'm trying to do. And then let's turn off the skin. We can take this and trim. Let's get rid of, let's get rid of that. We can take that polysurface, and then we can trim. And you can either do it in the perspective view to me, the perspective view is always fun. If you line this up like that, you can then start to click here in the middle. And you can watch the elevator go down as you click through. Zoom in a little bit so you can see it better. There we go. There goes the elevator. There we go. So we made it through the building. So now I have that core that goes through the building as well, which, which helps in the overall look of the building as we, as we start to see it. Uh, perhaps it needs two cores, but at least, at least one is reasonable. And then from here, it's a matter of going ahead and assigning some basic materials. So I would go into my material editor in V-Ray. Maybe not. You guys clearly shouldn't let me touch anything on your computer today. And let me go ahead and load in couple basic materials. Let's go with um, let's go with a concrete for the floor. So let's go to concrete. And we'll do just a basic concrete. I want that to apply to all the floors. So I'll right click on concrete, apply material to layer. And it's going to go to the floors layer. Then I will load in a ceiling material. So let me go to load materials and I'm not going to do concrete let's do interior wall and I'm going to do a textured sheet rock ceiling there and so we'll right click and say apply material to layer and I'll do it for the ceilings there we go 
Now I need a material for the outside. And so glass is still a little bit of a foreign concept. We haven't quite gotten there yet. But I have a cheater bit of glass that can be useful. Um, and let me see if it's on the web page. I know it's on the web page, but I don't know if I cross-linked it to today's exercise or not. No, I didn't cross-link it. Um, go to, under Resources, go to V-Ray Materials Library, and under Glass, there, well, I'll tell you what, I will, I will cross-link it because I have some skyscraper glass that will load correctly. If you downloaded the material package, you already have it, or you should already have it. If we right-click and say Load Material, we can then go into Glass, and there should be a di dark and a light skyscraper glass. I'm going to go ahead and pick the light skyscraper glass. And I'll make that one apply material to layer. And we'll do that for the skin. It's not a true glass. It's meant to mimic the mirror part of the, the skyscraper glass. So once I have that established, I'm going to do a basic rendering to get myself set up here. I probably need to have an infinite plane underneath my drawing. And then we'll go ahead. Oh, and that infinite plane needs to make sure that it's not on the glass layer, because that's going to be a problem. So we'll go ahead and change that back to being on the default layer. We'll zoom in on my object, and we'll give it a render and see how it turns out. So the default of this is never going to be that great, because our environment isn't set yet. So what I'm looking for is some basic concept of, ah, there's my shape. And then we'll, from, from here, we'll push it much further in next class. Okay, So I have a basic, hey, there's my shape. That's good. Next class, we'll start to introduce the, the rest of the scene. And then you'll really start to see it uh, in its full glory. If you finish one of these quickly, go ahead and do a few others to see how they start to feel. Um, ultimately, the more you have to choose from, once you get them into the site, you can kind of see which one feels, feels best. Okay. So I apologize that my, my first one didn't work. Obviously, you may run into the same problem once you do your transformations. Um, I'm more than happy to sit with you and try to, to work out what went wrong. At the same time, sometimes your best strategy is either to rebuild it or recreate it uh, and, then, and then do it again, which is obviously what I did here. Okay.